In this set of notes, we're going to be looking at chapter one in the modern chemistry text, um, sections 1-1, 1-2, and 1-3. So here we go. Let's talk about matter and energy. Uh, matter is all of the materials or substances in our um, universe, or at least on this planet, that have mass and take up any kind of space, whether we can um, visually see the space they are um, occupying or not, just the fact that they are out there and can be tested and manipulated tells us that there is matter in all forms. Um, there are basically four different states of matter, three of which I would imagine you are pretty familiar with. There are solids, which are um, generally a defined shape and do not display a lot of motion um, with the naked eye. The next one is liquids, slightly less defined shape, and they display quite a bit of motion. Gases have no defined shape whatsoever and display a high degree of motion and are generally fairly difficult to observe with the naked eye. And then we have this fourth state of matter, which you may or may not have heard of, called plasma. And plasma is essentially a highly energized state of gas like particles, um, but because plasma doesn't behave in the ways that neutral gases behave, it is a um, considered to be an entirely separate state of matter, and we can talk more about that as we um, move forward in the year. So um, you probably noticed as I discussed these that the degree to which the particles can move has a lot to do with what state of matter um, something is classified as. So here again, we have solid, we've got a nice liquid example there, and then a gas. Um, the characteristics that a substance or matter has um, depends on quite a few different things, but there are properties that are inherent or distinct to each type of matter. And even beyond that, within different types of matter, say solids, for instance, there are several different kinds, or dozens, in some cases hundreds of different kinds of substances that are all distinctly different. And they're different because they have properties that are specific to that type of substance. So color can be a property, odor is often a property. Um, these three we have kind of worked with a little bit so far this year, mass, volume, and density. So mass, how heavy it is, volume, how much space it occupies, and density is a comparison between those two um, factors. And then melting point, or at what, at what, goodness, at which temperature something goes from being a solid to a liquid. Boiling point is a similar property. That's the temperature at which something goes from being a liquid to becoming a gas. Um, all of these properties are specific to the substance, and they can be described either in terms of extensive characteristics, so that means it depends on how much matter there is, right? The mass of the substance um, will be different depending on how much of the substance you have. And, and in some cases, we'll talk about intensive properties like color, for example. Color is an intensive property because a certain substance has whatever color it has, whether you have a, an ounce of it or a ton of it. It's still going to have the same color. So when particles or substances change in state from solid to liquid or liquid to gas, they are changing their state but they are not becoming something else. So when we have a pot of water, right, and the water boils and you get steam rising, the water has not become, say, orange juice when it becomes steam. It's still water, it's just now water, instead of being in the liquid state, it's now water in the gaseous state. So we describe that as a physical change. There are other properties that are often used to describe substances and matter. And these properties are called chemical properties because they describe the ability of a substance to turn into another substance. So flammability or how easily it burns. When something burns, it forms new substances. Um, rusting describes how easily something reacts with oxygen to cause the formation of new substances. Um, reactivity in general 
how likely it is that the substance will bond to or um, in some way alter other substances is described as reactivity. And then how likely it is for the substance to um, grow or develop uh, more um, than is originally present. And decomposition is how likely does that substance um, want to break down? How quickly will it disintegrate into something else? These are descriptions of chemical properties. And the big key here, the big difference between chemical properties and physical properties is the likelihood of new substances being formed. There are a lot of ways to detect whether or not this has occurred. Um, the production of a gas is often a good symptom or um, indication that you've had a chemical change, although not always. Um, the formation of a solid from one or more liquids. So let's say we've got this blue liquid. Maybe this is copper sulfate, which happens to be a blue substance. And let's say this is, oh goodness, I don't know, off the top of my head, um, sodium hydroxide perhaps or something. And we combine these two substances together. And they start out as a liquid, but when we pour them together, what we get is this big, solid, dark cloud of a new third substance, all suspended within this liquid component. That's called a precipitate, and it's a super cool reaction. You will do lots of these in the near future, so get ready for that. Um, any kind of color change can often indicate the formation of a new substance and a temperature change. If something suddenly becomes very hot or very cold, that tells us that there has been some kind of chemical reaction taking place most of the time. So we've been talking kind of generally here about substances and matter, but it specifically in the world of chemistry, all of the matter on Earth is made up of one or more elements. There are somewhere in the neighborhood of 111 or so elements. Um, different unique matter properties are specific to each one of those substances, and they are completely unique from all of the other elements in the world. So elements you are probably familiar with are gold, silver, carbon, oxygen, um, hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, things like that. And we will talk about all of these elements in great detail. When two elements come together, or even more than two in some cases, let's say, for example, sugar has carbon and hydrogen and oxygen in a pretty specific ratio. When these three elements come together in a certain pattern, they form a compound known as sugar. So compounds are whenever other elements, multiple elements, come together and form a new substance. And just like each element has its own specific properties, each compound has its own specific properties. And those properties are due to the exact ratio of elements found within. We'll be talking quite a bit about this in the coming chapters. Um, compounds are defined and set and always have the same ratio. Again, common compounds that you have heard of are water, for instance. You've heard somebody say that water is H2O. And that's because there are two hydrogens and one oxygen in every compound of water. Every single type of water has that same ratio. And carbon dioxide is another one. There is one carbon and two oxygens in every substance of carbon dioxide. So those are just two common examples. Um, in the world, most of the matter that we encounter every day, water, carbon dioxide, air, etc., cetera, um, is an example of a compound. It's a mixture of two or more elements. But there are some cases in which you will encounter or be asked to describe pure substances. Pure substances um, are a very defined ratio of elements that are the same everywhere. Even though they have um, more than one element, the more than one element is exactly the same and it's not dependent upon um, the environment in which you find it. So carbon dioxide gas, I just told you, 
is a compound, but it's a compound that's considered a pure substance because it's always a fixed ratio of one carbon and two oxygens, and it doesn't um, have any impurities dependent upon the environment in which you find it. And we will talk about lots of compounds that do have various impurities, um, but we'll save that for another conversation. Table salt is another example. It always has just one sodium and just one chloride. Whereas pure substances are completely um, predictable and always the same regardless of environment, there are other kinds of compounds called mixtures that are perhaps even more common on earth and things that you will encounter quite a lot. Um, mixtures are compounds that can vary depending on their circumstance or environment. And so there are two different um, types of mixtures, and these words come from the Greek, so you'll see these roots in lots of places, but the first one is homogeneous. Homo means same, genus means kind. In biology, you talked about genus as one of the classifications of life, and it's the same word here. It's just spelled slightly differently because of changes over time um, in our language, but homogeneous means mixtures that are the same throughout the entire mixture, not throughout the entire world or throughout every environmental condition, but throughout the entire mixture. So for example, a can of Coke, right? If you open the Coke and pour it into a glass that you can see through, the Coke looks the same at the top, it looks the same if you view it from above, it looks the same from the bottom, it looks the same from the side. It's all the same mixture. Conversely, the other type of mixture is called heterogeneous. So the root hetero means different. Heterogeneous mixtures have different properties depending on where you view them. And I, my example here is chicken soup, though there, you know, you could use sand or um, chocolate chip cookie dough or all kinds of other things. But in this case, we'll use chicken soup. So if you look at the chicken soup from right here, right, you see big chunks of chicken. If we poured this into a glass bowl that was see-through and looked from the side, maybe you would just see a whole bunch of broth over here. Or if you happen to look from this angle, then you're getting carrot or you're getting herbs or whatever. But the mixture has different properties depending on where you happen to be looking at any given time and depending on, say, who takes the scoop out of the pot. Some people get lots of chicken, other people get very little. That's a heterogeneous mixture. Depending on where you are in the substance itself, there are different properties. And we will, I'm saying this a lot this lecture, but we'll be talking about this quite a bit more going forward. So we're just about there. Sometimes in chemistry, actually quite a lot of the time in chemistry, we want to take apart a substance and look at it in terms of its components. Um, and we do this through a variety of ways, but the compilation of these methods is called separation. Um, and I'm just going to kind of mention these really briefly. We're not going to talk a lot about them at this point. But there are lots of ways to pull mixtures apart. Um, you can distill the mixture, which means to heat it up, and any liquid component will evaporate off, and it will leave behind the solid component. Lots of times um, in this evaporation process, there will be some kind of collecting vessel. So we'll collect the gas that has evaporated, and then you can cool this back down, and you've got a liquid of one type and the solids of another type that previously were all combined in one mixture, and we can analyze those parts separately. Um, in kind of a similar process, filtration pours a liquid mixture through a filter, which causes the liquid to go all the way through and be collected in some kind of a vessel. And then on top, we end up with the solids kind of stuck here in the filter itself. So again, we can analyze the liquid from the solid components. Um, some of the other methods your book mentions are vaporization, which is similar to distillation, and paper chromatography, um, in which we use a liquid solution, put a piece of highly absorbent paper into the solution, and what happens is the paper absorbs this liquid, and the heavier parts of the liquid will get kind of stuck down here. It's hard for them to move up the paper, and the lighter parts, let's say maybe we've got something in here that's also a green substance, 
that will go a little bit higher up and then say maybe we've got something in that mixture that's even a purple substance that's lighter yet and that will go higher up. And then you can see the different parts all stored within this little absorbent paper. It's a very cool process. Um, regardless of which way we alter these mixtures, these are all physical changes. We're not taking the solids and making them into a new substance. We're just analyzing the solids separate from the liquids within the mixture. So finally, um, it's important that you realize and recognize that a lot of times in chemistry when we're changing states of matter or we are changing um, compounds or mixtures from one thing into something else, in most cases, we have to use some kind of energy in order to accomplish those tasks. And energy is just simply the ability to do work or having the capacity to carry out a specific task. Um, generally, in chemistry, we use energy in the form of heat to alter a substance. Oh, well, that's just dazzling spelling. That really is an E. Let's pretend it looks like one. Okay. So we use heat to transfer energy from one object to another. So in our example of um, evaporation, for instance, we use we could use, say, a gas burner or an electric stove. We use that heat energy to um, transfer temperature to the water, and then that temperature transfer causes evaporation to occur. So the heat itself is a flow of energy. It's not the energy source, it's the flow of energy. The source might be the gas burner or the electricity, but the heat itself is the flow of energy from one substance or one location to another. More energy re, um, results in more movement of particles, which causes lots of collisions between particles, and those collisions often lead to melting and then eventually to boiling and evaporating. And um, we will study energy quite a bit in lots of different forms, so you have that to look forward to. Um, please come to class tomorrow or whenever I next see you with three questions that you would like, uh, holy cow, can you tell I'm tired? Three questions that you would like clarification on um, that you were prompted to think of during this lecture that you just didn't understand. Write them in the questions in main ideas column and we will talk about them in class. Thanks very much.